Thanks for joining us on the program Beyond 100 Days. I am Abbo Sidi Adenio Adoemi. You can jump the conversation now on X using the hashtag Beyond 100 Days and TVC News NG. President Bola Tinubu was the special guest of honor at the public presentation of a book titled Working with Buhari, Reflections of a Special Advisor, Media and Publicity, 2015 to 2023. The book, written by Femi Adishino, was presented alongside five volumes of another book titled Muhammad Buhari, The Nigerian Legacy, 2015 to 2023. Former President Muhammad Buhari was in attendance, and that was his first official trip to the federal capital since he left at the end of his tenure as president on the 29th of May last year. This is also the first time President Bola Tinubu and his predecessor will both attend an event since President Tinubu assumed office on the 29th of May. The book launch had in attendance ministers that served in former President Buhari's federal cabinet and other presidential aides. After handing over, you said, I would fire away in Daura. But if you need me, contact me. But I won't intrude in whatever you are doing. I won't interfere or bring down, breathe down your throat. We've partnered to make democracy flourish in Nigeria. President Muhammad Buhari. Thank you. Except when I call him to say, are you living? Are you being in the farm? You don't hear from him. Either to nominate or intrude in the cabinet, <laughs> or complain about your questions. Thank you for being who you are, a civic. Let me thank the President Asuaju Bola Ahmed for finding time to attend this launch. Our relationship has always been correct and cordial. This we have done, and the present Bola Ahmed administration has my support and confidence in the quest for us, in the quest for us to have a country of our dreams where there is emancipation for our team and population. For the cumulative achievements of government after government, I believe we will get there in no distant future. In our journey to the desired destination, there will be hard decisions taken, and the people would bear some costs. We can only seek their understanding and state that there was no intention to deliberately inflict pain and anguish on anyone. And away from that, the security situation in the federal capital territory is a call for concern among residents and visitors to the capital city. The FCT Public Complaints Commissioner, Delhat Ezekiel, has now called for a state of emergency on the state of security in the FCT. At a news briefing in Abuja, the Complaints Commission said it received several reports of threats to lives and property in Abuja. Happy Dalawal reports. The recent frightening security threats in the country's capital confirms fears of many Nigerians that the Islamist insurgents and other armed groups had now national threats that have reached critical levels. The capacity of the groups to expand outside their base, even extending to the nation's capital, means that the authorities need to greatly increase their efforts to protect people. Kidnapping people from their homes is now the new kind of terrorism in the FCT. The FCT Public Complaints Commission is inundated with calls and information of terror attacks in different communities within the FCT. The commission says the brazen act of kidnapping for ransom in the nation's capital is worrisome and there is need for urgent intervention. 
have to raise this red flag. If need be, the minister of FCT should declare a state of emergency and security to ensure that our community are saved. As we speak, the members of our local communities no longer go to farm. And if they cannot go to their farms, it then means the food security is under threat. There is going to be food security, insecurity. There is going to be crisis in terms of food. Interagency security collaboration has also been emphasized as one of the ingredients that helps in combating insecurity. It's happening, the strategy we are adopting now needs to be changed because it's not working. We need to engage and empower the civilian JTF because when it happens, what we do is reactional. We deploy security agencies, they go there, do operation, and come back. And these criminals have intelligence. As soon as the security return back, they go back to the other community. In fact, when they go to attack Buari, and we deploy security to Buari, they go back to Kuje. All these incidents, as well as other reports of kidnapping in the federal capital, have spread fear, panic, and apprehension among citizens. The close proximity of some of these attacks to the seat of power and their actions which has continued to go unchecked has instilled fear in the minds of residents of the federal capital. Habib Alawal, TVC News, Abuja. And meanwhile, Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Nyesam Wike, has summoned an emergency security meeting where he assured residents that their safety is guaranteed. Bandits have been breaking into houses and picking up residents from the comfort of their homes. The incident, which have created tension, reached its height when some residents, including a 13-year-old secondary school student, were killed over failure to meet deadline of ransom payment. But all of us are concerned as the federal capital territory that houses virtually every Nigerian. We owe a duty to make sure that uh, this place is safe. We'll do all we can. And we're sure Nigerians who reside here that there's no need for panic. We're taking every step to make sure that those no challenges are that we must have to resolve. So this meeting is practically to look into such challenges and see how we'll be able to resolve the problems. Well, let's now talk about the security situation in Nigeria. And joining me, Oami and Ohideve, the National Secretary, retired members of the Nigerian Armed Forces. He joined us via Zoom from Dallas, Texas. And with me here in the studio is Dixie Nosaje. He is an anti-terrorism specialist. Let's begin with you, uh, Mr. Hidevier. Uh, yesterday, Monday, was uh, the Armed Forces Remembrance Day. And uh, as a retired member of the Nigerian Armed Forces, uh, how did you feel about the day and uh, the sacrifices that you and others have had to put in to ensure a united and uh, safe Nigeria? The opportunity and um, thank you for making reference to the belated um, traumatic experience we call um, Armed Forces Remembrance Day. Um, every year we, we come back to this circle, this rigorous circle of um, trauma and um, I assure you that um, this present um, regime of um, President um, Tinubu will look into it because so many documents have been forwarded to the President we are expecting the onboarding of the Armed Forces um, Federation of Nigeria, and um, we are expecting speedy access to every constitutional approvals for veterans. So right now, um, veterans are not smiling because um, we need to still do street protest. We need to still do the embarrassment of coming out to always air our views in public. And then we are still counting losses from the numbers of veterans that die every day. All right, then. And, uh, you know, talking about efforts by security agencies, let's talk about the situation in uh, Nigeria and especially in the nation's capital this time. And I would come to 
uh, Dixon for this. It's 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 been huge. It's been serious. I mean, it's been very worrying. Uh, we just heard about Michelle, a 15 year old girl, a secondary school student, picked up alongside her family members from their compound. I mean, where they live, and uh, because the family couldn't meet the deadline for payment of ransom, she was murdered. I mean, you would wonder what she and others have done to merit this level, this, to experience this level of brutality, really. Well, for me, I think uh, the offense they committed is being a Nigerian, and uh, that is disturbing because uh, the Constitution states very clear, stated it very clearly that the sole responsibility of government is, is the possession of lives and property. That is the primary responsibility. And uh, this is beyond government uh, issues uh, because most people think uh, the government, the government, the government. We are suffering from societal threats, and uh, these guys are taking the fight to our comfort zone, to our homes, to our residents. And uh, I think uh, I would advise the government to declare a state of emergency. This is not good for our image. Uh, the international community are disturbed because uh, consistently from 2013 to 2009, when Boko Haram sprang up, we've been experiencing high speed of insecurity, negative news every day. Tomorrow morning, nobody knows what is going to uh, come to the news. Uh, for me, I think uh, it's enough is enough. Uh, if you take a life because of uh, monetary value, that tells you that you don't have respect for human lives. That these guys are animals. They are, they are evils. They are demons. Uh, because uh, how, how do you think you can buy the life of Mitchell? You can't buy the life. A billion dollars cannot buy the life of Mitchell. And nothing can bring her back. So these guys just think uh, uh, the, the, the love for money uh, is equitable to taking human lives. So and uh, one of the major errors, uh, that led to this uh, evil act is because I think we bargaining with the devil. Uh, we must cut off negotiation with any uh, any criminal element in the Nigerian territorial space. We'll, we'll, Everybody must be meant to pay for their crime. Mm, all right, we'll get to talk some more about that. But you mentioned something about the state of emergency, and the minister of the FCT in some week earlier today summoned a national, I mean, a security uh, meeting there, you know, high profile meeting, and then he promised to uh, combat to combat the bandits. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Mr. Ohideve. Uh, the FCT minister is stepping in. He's talking tough. He said that the area council chairpersons need to be committed to this cause and that he would leave no stone unturned in ensuring the safety of Abuja residents. How reassuring is that for you? Well, I think um, we are still going around in rhetorics and um, we, we are not capturing the threats, the vulnerabilities and deterrence measures. Nigeria is opportune to have um, adequate deterrence measures set on ground, like our policing system. Every nook and cranny, there's supposed to be a police station, there's supposed to be a DPO, and then um, there's supposed to be a combat unit that can respond to a certain catchment of area. You know, so, but we build cities every day. Abuja is expanding every day. People are giving licenses to get C of O. They just renewed it now for 5 million Naira. People are giving opportunities to build estates. People are giving opportunities to expand into hinterlands. And you, you don't consider the presence of policing, you know, adequate police presence by structure, by equipment, and by manpower. You know, so what you must have this. If not, you will be going back to the native system of engaging JTF and uh, vigilantes. And at the end of the day, you come back to say the vigilantes and the JTF, they are abusing human rights, they are supporting kidnappers. Then Wiki himself now is talking to area council command. Some people are talking to local government chairman. That is not a federal security structure. You know, you can talk to those people to generate intelligence, but to put in deterrence measures and to highlight the presence of the federal government and its interest into constraining activities of criminality must be shown. But as it stands, uh, would you say that uh, the presence of police stations or posts are actually enough deterrent measures? Because we've heard cases where bandits were actually, I mean, their camp was just opposite a police station. They're in the nation's yes, capital, that, Abuja. But, you know, the, the current um, police service commission chairman now, um, Dr. Solomon Arase, I think they just released that they are going to recruit 3,000 policemen. That 3,000 policemen they want to reduce and, and recruit, sorry, it's even a minimal startup number. You know, we should look at zonal recruitment, speedy, 
and we should look at enriching the quality of policing. If you go to Nigeria now, you see a lot of federal universities and state universities and private universities that run criminology and security studies. You go to those universities, take the database, and send SMS to all the students that have graduated within a time. You see some of them are riding Kurope. Some of them are doing um, one mania job or the other for 40,000, 50,000 naira. If you employ them and you say you are paying them 150, 200,000 naira per month, I'm sure that you will have enough policing in Nigeria. And that's the target for the federal government. No. Well, let me come to uh, Mr. Saji. Well, one thing is to recruit these police officers. Another thing is the quality, which he has uh, you know, spoken about. Do we have the resources, really, you know, to fund them and ensure that the quality meets standard? Well, you see, security measures uh, come in three forms. You know, most times we think it's just human factors. Oh, yes, human factors is the supreme uh, uh, lead uh, when it comes to security management. But there are three factors that come to play. Uh, the uh, technological factors as well. Then the processes uh, in place. Oh, yes, uh, we have the capability. I, I will tell you for free that... Uh, our, our officers and men are trained very hard. They, are, they have the capability. We have the capacity. But uh, the issue here is that uh, the, uh, the fight is, uh, is becoming uh, disturbing because of our governed space, because of our uh, unprotected borders. Uh, because you ask me, where are these guys coming from? Uh, after carrying out their act, where did they go to? Where did they take refuge? Because when they come from your governed space, what they do, they carry out their ill activities and they fall back to the ungoverned space. So we need to start making that ungovernable space ungovernable for this uh, criminal element. We must go before the laws because when we talk about security, uh, we're talking about going before the laws. Each time uh, you go after the occasion of crime, each time you go after, the, after an hostage uh, taking incident, uh, security has been defeated. So for me, if we talk about recruiting 3,000 officers and men to combat this issue, well, it's a good development. Let's start from there. But we need to pursue these guys. Take the fight to these guys, you know. And uh, they are going to homes, uh, uh, estates, and uh, picking people from their house. Nobody's going to uh, sleep, want to sleep uh, well at night. So for me, the government should start looking at, uh, you know, having an effective uh, synergy. The police, the army, the navy, the air force needs to come and synergize. Hey, we have a problem at hand. And the problem at hand is that the Nigerian territorial space has been threatened by some group of criminal elements. Who are these criminal elements? How do we fetch them and bring them to book? Is it that we fetch them today, tomorrow we grant them amnesty? Amnesty? Uh, a picture was flying around some few days ago that one dead, uh, one, one terrorist or one uh, gang leader or whatever the case uh, has been recruited into the constabulary force. No, 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 no. Either constabulary force, policing, private guard services, no criminal must find its way into our protective services. That is why before you join the military, you have to undergo background check. You need to check where you're coming from. Have you been an ex-convict or were you once a criminal? Nobody must be given the opportunity to serve the Nigerian state protection-wise if you're an ex-convict. And people must be meant to pay for the crime they commit against the Nigerian state. If you don't punish people, uh, a boss a day, crime will flourish. And that is the truth. If you grant amnesty to criminals, crime will flourish. They would think that the Nigerian space is where you come, commit crime, go back to the government, appease the government, they will not grant you amnesty. Amnesty for what? No. I believe in de-radicalization. I believe in reintegration. But you must be punished. And that's why you have the correctional facilities in place for you to go through the correctional facilities for the purpose of rehabilitation. In exception of cases of felony and uh, a treasonable offense or taking energy. You can't kill someone and get amnesty. When you kill someone, you pay for it. So we need to start looking at our punishment measures, our punishment mechanism, the judicial system, the courts, and the prison. We need to come together and make sure that we bring people back to book. Mm -hmm. If we don't hold people accountable for crime they commit, crime will continue to flourish in the Nigerian territorial space, no matter the number of people you are employed into the Nigerian security service. You services. talked about the correctional facilities. Are they really equipped for a place where people should be de-radicalized? People go there and come out more hardy of a criminal. That's the problem as well, because the correctional facility is meant for rehabilitation, retribution. Because when you are punished for a crime, you are expected to, you know, be reformed and be reintegrated back to the society, you know, to live a better life and to support or, you know, do well for the Nigerian state. But I don't know what's happening in the correctional facilities. Do we need to privatize it? For me, I will advise we privatize our correctional facilities. Let's understand why. These guys go to the prison, come back more hard than a criminal. Nobody's even scared to go to go into the prison again. I can name one or two cases where guys who came out from prison activity uh, services organized themselves, build a ten man gang squad, and try to uh, you know assassinate one of my clients. So I understand what is happening in the Nigerian territorial space. We need to start holding people accountable. You know, accountability needs to come to the come to the table as well, from the vertical and horizontal plane. Everyone needs to be accountable in your own uh, uh, space of duty. You don't come and serve the Nigerian state and just go without accountability. When we start holding them accountable, 
all our leaders, both service chiefs, police officers and men, I tell you, we will get things right in our country, Nigeria. All right, accountability. Now let's talk about the place of uh, technology. Uh, Mr. Hidiyeve, in the Abuja issue now, we've seen that, you know, the bandits have actually reached out to the families and demanded an increase, you know, in ransom. And that's because of the public outcry that this issue is generating. Uh, I mean, what do you make of that, the place of ransom payment? Should families actually, you know, heed these calls? Or should they just, you know, rely solely on the fact that the security agencies would be on the trail of these attackers and bring their loved ones back home? Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you also for this um, opportunity. You see, um, I want to take us back to the time of um, Abakiari. You know, when certain kidnap cases and uh, high profile cases are speedily closed. Before you know what's happening, you see the kidnapper being paraded, you know, or the soft targets being paraded. And the, the onus then was on discoveries that um, Abakari actually has certain devices that he bought himself that he uses to execute such. So I'm asking. Is that not a template? Let's say nobody knows anything. We don't know about technology. But is that not a template? We already had also when um, we arrested them, um, Evans the kidnapper, everything about the book 101 on kidnapping. Evans the kidnapper has a template. And this template was unveiled throughout his interviews, his interrogations, and all the statements he wrote, all his witnesses and the victims. Now, do we not have a template? You know, you remember Wadume also. Wadume was caught up and brought in, and there was interagency clashes. People died. Officers died. And at the end of the day, there was a panel tribunal set up. So were there no lessons there? You see, so there are lessons. It's not for us to continue on all of these stories. One of the opportunities we had was our communication system. The MTN, the Airtel, the Nine Mobile, the Globacom, all of them, you know, they were constricted to run under the Ministry of Communications. And we were headed by someone who also agreed that, yes, we'll do NIN, we'll do BVN, we'll do all of these things to track the activities of persons. And we're going to unify the international passport, the driver's license, so that anywhere I go, I use my ATM card, I use my international passport to scan anywhere, I pay money through transactions, my movements and my presence and my notification will be beeping. Now, there should be central areas to handle all of this. So let's use the FCT for an example, where our greatest of executives are. You know, that should be a template. We are using Lagos as a template those days. Remember, every state wants to be like Lagos, you know, and the social security system and the, all the partnership and all that. So what about Abuja? What is the template in Abuja? If I make a phone call from location X to location Z, how can it be tracked, communicated? I do investigations a lot. I do ransom delivery, you know, and... In all of those cases I've handled in my private security experience in Nigeria, I've just discovered that there are areas and regions of compromise, especially in the systemic um, processes. Mm. Like the police, the police will need to write to the judiciary, the court, they will need to write to the communications, they will need to write to the bank. To so there's some bureaucratic to... bottlenecks, so, is that what yeah. you're saying? All of those things come together to give it this um, constraint that we see and gives the criminal the upper hand. All right. So how do we tackle this uh, you know, bottleneck that we're experiencing and ensure that these details that government agencies continue to get from us as citizens can be collated, unified, just as he has said, to ensure our security? Well, a fantastic point, uh, Ambassador Rod, I just made uh from Dallas. You see, uh, security is achievable. Sometimes we think security is rocket science. Security is achievable. You know, the whole essence of uh, crime prevention is to bring it to as low as reasonably acceptable. You and I, we're going to live with crime till eternity. Uh, thousands of years ago, Cain killed his brother Abel. So that was when we experienced the first murder case in this universe. So we're going to live with crime till, uh, till eternity. So I'm not coming here to come and tell you that the military, the police will be able to eliminate criminality in this country. Never. We will live with it till eternity. 
bet the only sense is for us to reduce it. We can't be getting sad news every day here and there. It talks about this police going through processes before they could be able to, you know, you know, track most of these criminal elements. I have about 30 seconds to wrap up. Yeah, so I will advise the government to, you know, give the police the, the power of autonomy, you know, to, you know, with the devices. They don't need to start writing some technological uh, uh, agencies. They should, you know, come together, give them all the devices they need so that they'll be able to track this criminal with speed and momentum. Because when you talk about crime uh, management or crime prevention, time is very important with speed and momentum. So the Nigerian police should be well equipped, technological wise, then manpower wise, they should also be equipped so that we'll be able to live and move around without being intimidated or coerced by these criminal, uh, criminal elements. Uh, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. National Secretary, retired members of Nigerian Armed Forces, Wamien Okideve, who joined us live from Dallas in Texas. Thank you very much. And uh, counter-terrorism, that's anti-terrorism specialist, Dixon Asaji. Thank, thank you. you very much for your time on the Thank show you, boss. Thank you.